Phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
folks. Today is Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. I told y'all Republicans in Tennessee were going to be going after Tennessee State University. We'll talk to uh, a state official, state representative, wrote a letter quashing these concerns regarding uh, a state takeover Tennessee State, but... Hmm. What's going on in Tennessee? And that HBCU will talk about it. Uh, a new Intuit study reveals that disparities that black entrepreneurs face when trying to start a business are real. No shit, really? We knew that. We'll talk with a business expert about their survey. The Supreme Court heard arguments dealing with Google over their responsibility when it comes to harmful videos. We'll talk to a digital expert uh, with regards to that very issue. Plus, a Nevada police officer was captured on cell phone video slamming a high school student to the ground and pinning him underneath his knee. We'll be joined by the ACLU of Nevada uh, regarding this particular issue. Plus, in our marketplace segment, uh, one man's solution to make home ownership a reality for folks in Atlanta after building the nation's first black-owned black owned micro-home community will explain exactly what that is. And plus, a white woman acts a fool when a black man is shoveling snow on a sidewalk. She literally shovels it back on a sidewalk. Really? It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. Folks, Roland Martin here in Los Angeles. Um, I told you months ago about Tennessee State University, what was happening when it came to funding there. One of the issues uh, that the state determined, they were owed some more than $500 million. But Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, has only given them $250 million. But also there are some restrictions as to how they can actually spend the money. Now a number of people on social media talking about how Tennessee wants to take over Tennessee State University want to remove the independent governance of the university and put them under the Tennessee Board of Regents. Well, is that true or not? Joining us right now uh, is a state rep in Tennessee 
who has written a letter uh, dealing with this very issue. Uh, Har Harold Love, Jr. Virginia Love, how you doing? Doing well. Thank you for having me on the show. Okay, so let's walk through walk through this here. Uh, is the state of Tennessee trying to remove the independent governance of Tennessee State and move them under the Tennessee Board of Regents? No, the Board of Regents uh, was the former governing system for Tennessee State University and other universities in Tennessee. And at one point, we passed what's called the FOCUS Act, which allowed every university to then have its own board of trustees. That board of trustees is appointed by the governor and confirmed by the legislature. So, so every, this has been, again... Uh, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, so every university has to come before our government operations committee, and the board of trustees are asked a series of questions pertaining to the operations of the university. So Tennessee State was supposed to come up last summer because their board is supposed to automatically sunset in 2023 if something's not done, as every university is always uh, given a chance to, again, have their board to come before the government operations committee and list out what they've done to help that particular university operate. All right, I got to go to a break. We come back. I want to talk about uh, the money that was allocated. I saw an interview where uh, Eddie George, the head football coach of Tennessee State, uh, complained that Tennessee TSU officials were not able to use the money as they saw fit. There were limitations placed on them. There have also been complaints that from white legislators there in Tennessee about how they're recruiting black students. Uh, and I, we played the video where this guy was like, well, like this, this is hurting other institutions. And the president of Tennessee State was like, well, we do a great job. So we'll talk about all of that uh, and break all of this thing down. Uh, so give me one second, folks. We, you're watching Roller Mart Unfiltered. We're broadcasting live from Los Angeles. This is the week of the NAACP Image Awards. Uh, of course, don't forget to support us. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. We'll be right back on Roller Mart Unfiltered. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. next a balanced life with me dr jackie a relationship that we have to have we're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it that's right we're talking about our relationship with money and here's the thing our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not the truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge balancing your relationship with your pocketbook that's next on a balanced life with me dr jackie here at black star network Hi, I'm Vivian Green. You're hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, Unfiltered.
We're back here in Los Angeles. We're talking with State Representative Harold Love Jr. from Tennessee. Representative Love, uh, you wrote in this letter, you said the $250 million for building repairs and construction that was put in the budget January 2022 was made available to TSU on July 1st, 2022, when the new fiscal year started. An additional $92 million was approved before July 1st, 2022 for two new buildings, $60 million for engineering and $32 million for agriculture. And so we've heard different folks say, oh, TSU is getting the money, but they can't use it the way they see fit. Explain that. So in Tennessee State's case, a lot of people thought that the money should have been able to be used for building dormitories. And in Tennessee, the legislature does not allocate money for what we call revenue generating buildings. That would be dormitories. That would be also stadiums. And so Tennessee State's money that was allocated was to improve the infrastructure on campus to repair the education uh, and administration buildings. And that's the limitation that's placed on that. I really cannot hear a representative love, so uh, I need you guys to see uh, what's going on here. I heard us coming back from break. Uh, and so, so, Representative Love, I'll ask you this question here. Again, we're talking about, uh, again, this whole issue um, with, um, again, this, this it was, it's all over social media. Uh, folks have been sending to us uh, left and right. So we're trying to get a better understanding of what's really happening uh, with the university. And again, this talk about uh, a t takeover. Now, in the letter, you talked about the Senate ad hoc committee uh, having questions about the current leadership's ability to effectively lead the university. Uh, the Comptroller's Office interviewed students, faculty, and staff to gain a better understanding of complaints they received from parents and students. The committee will review the report at a hearing on February 23rd. So before we get to the complaints, so apparently there were people who were suggesting that uh, there was going to be a vote on February 23rd to take Tennessee State and put them under uh, the Tennessee Board of Regents. You say that is not correct, right? Correct. The Senate ad hoc committee that's meeting on the 23rd does not have the ability to make that particular vote. That's vested in the power of the Government Operations Committee, which is meeting the 27th of February. Representative Love, I'll ask you this here as well. So let's talk about these complaints, all right, and the questioning of the leadership. Um, Look, there are always complaints. One of the issues that Tennessee State has dealt with is that the, the, the rapid increase uh, in enrollment had a housing issue. So we're talking about these complaints. Um, what are you hearing? Are people suggesting that Dr. Glenn Glover should not be president? Uh, and and so, so talk about this, uh, these complaints and this, what, what this committee is going to then provide in this report or the comptroller is going to provide. Right. So the comptroller's office has a department called the HERO office higher education resource officer. And that particular office is uh, designed to have persons who have issues or concerns about our universities to be able to call them and to be able to list out those things that they have concerns about. That would allow the comptroller's office to go and investigate if the, the, the complaints are warranted. And so in this particular instance, when we had students calling and emailing about the lack of housing, and also about some scholarships not being fulfilled, the comptroller's office then went and interviewed students and faculty and administration, and they are uh, putting their report together, which will come out, I believe, tomorrow, and this will detail the responses to those questions they had. The Senate Ad Hoc Committee also wanted the comptroller's office to give them information about what they discovered in those same interviews. All right, last question for you, um, um, Representative Love, uh, again. Um, when it comes to what is next, the state report said the Tennessee state was owed $500 million. They did $250 million. When is Tennessee state going to get the other $250 million? So the initial $250 million that eventually became $350 million was designed to repair the infrastructure of the university. That includes, again, all the education buildings and possibly build, again, new library, new engineering building, new agriculture building. The design is to have those buildings repaired 
so that when you increase programs with additional funds, you then have a proper place to house those programs. What you don't want to do is start in increasing access to your chemistry program and you don't have the adequate uh, labs to have the, the chemistry students do their work in there. You don't want to expand other programs and not have the facilities for that. Let me commend Dr. Glover on this. She is trying to take Tennessee State from a Research 2 to a Research 1 institution, and the extra dollars, the additional money, could primarily be used to do that, to hire more professors, again, to expand the programs at the university. But first, you must have the facilities to be repaired. Tennessee State is in need of approximately $344 million worth of uh, infrastructure repairs, and this $250 million goes a long way. There's no plan for Tennessee State to be taken over, to be under the Tennessee Board of Regents, correct? That's correct. There, there are options listed, I believe, in the report that will include uh, improving communication between the board and the president. But the Board of Regents is not designed to run a four-year institution. They did in previous years. They uh, are designed to help institutions like Tennessee State, as they currently do with our capital maintenance. But there's, there's an opportunity there for the Board of Regents to provide assistance to Tennessee State uh, should they need assistance. And if the board is vacated and replaced with new members, there's also an opportunity for the Board of Regents to provide guidance. Representative Love, I appreciate you joining us on the show to give us the breakdown of what's happening at Tennessee State. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, keep us abreast of what happens next uh, with the university. Folks, one of the reasons why this is important is because of what we've seen uh, with Prairie View a &M University. What we also are seeing what's happening with Florida, with Governor Ron DeSantis and the whole issue of critical race theory, his kids complaining about woke and the impact on HBCUs. And so whether we're talking about Tennessee State or Florida A&M or Prairie View A&M, there should be great concern among African-Americans about our state HBCUs, our public HBCUs having to be in these red states. You've got, and look, North Carolina, you've got a Democratic governor, but you've got a Republican legislature in uh, Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas. Florida. And so when we talk about our largest HBCUs, they are in these red states. And so it is incumbent upon us, and we talk about voting all the time. Folks, when you have these right-wing Republicans who are over these universities, the problem that we're going to have is they are going to be controlling the policy, the policy of these institutions. And that is of grave concern to all of us. And so if we, as African Americans, are not fully involved, this is what Ruth Simmons was talking about when she talked about what Prairie View folks need to be focused on when it comes to the institutions, when it comes to standing up, fighting for them. That's where we need to be uh, in our institutions and understand what we're up against. We are dealing with people who do not have the same mission that we do. They control the purse strings. They control the dollars. They control all of those different things. And so all of us need to understand what we are up against and what we are facing. Um, what I want to do right now is, uh, folks, let me know how much time we'll go to the next break. Uh, I want to pull up uh, my panel today uh, and uh, uh, introduce them. Uh, because, again, folks, uh, this is, we're going to see more of these things happen uh, as we move forward uh, in the future. Mustafa Santiago Ali, former senior advisor for environmental justice at the EPA. Dr. Candace Matthews, statewide vice chair, Texas Coalition of Black Democrats. And at 6.30 tomorrow, Solomon Simmons is going to be joining us, civil rights attorney and founder of Justice for Greenwood. Uh, Mustafa, I, I laid out there again when Republicans are in control of the, the state, when they have the power, they can make decisions or impacting uh, HBCUs. And so if, if the HBCU graduates and the students are not fully focused, they need to understand you're going to be at the behest of these Republicans that could be devastating to these HBCUs. 
Most definitely. And you know, it was interesting that um, Representative Love had shared about revenue generating buildings. Um, I'd never heard before someone not wanting to support um, dorms because we understand that if students don't have a place to, to live um, and to study, then it's going to be difficult for them to choose, um, you know, an institution like that. So for for that to be a part of how Tennessee is deciding about resources, um, it, it's very it's very concerning because it, it stops the growth, if you will, of many of our institutions that many students are now paying more attention to and saying, I want to go to an HBCU. But it goes back again to the power, the power of the decision maker, those individuals who are there um, in the state house um, and others uh, who are choosing about which institutions are going to grow which institutions are going to receive the resources and which ones won't. This, um, when we talk about, again, who controls, I talk all the time about leverage, influence, power. Those who control the purse strings, they have the power. We've got to, though, use our leverage and influence to put pressure on them, let them know, you screw our HBCUs, you're screwing with black people. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know what, Roland? I hey. um, Can you hear me, sir? Okay, I am in complete agreement. To that statement because you got to keep in mind we are here in texas the battleground state the state where you have a lot of racism a lot of systemic racism and then let's just look at it because i am a hbcu uh texas southern university and i'm very familiar with prairie view and m because that's right down the street from my house and so basically prairie view is pretty much like the uh the sister school for the Texas A&M University, right? So with Dr. Simmons, they were more or less like, okay, you know what? Um, you can just hold this position just as a position, but you don't have any control. See, we have to let them know that you're not gonna do that to none of our HBCUs, because if not, then this is what happens when you have the, the master puppet master that's gonna control everything, and then nine times out of 10, we'll try to make HBCUs obsolete. Quickly before I go to break, um, we look, you've got, of course, um, elections coming up. You've got the presidential election. But I keep telling folks, like in Virginia, every seat is up. We have got to be focused and locked on state races. There are opportunities to control the different houses. And one of the reasons why you see with gerrymandering, of course, but you also see what is happening in these other places is that we are not in full control of our voting power. As long as we're voting 30, 35, 40 percent, we're not maximizing our power. If we're voting at 70, 75 percent, we could be changing what's happening in a lot of these states. They are banking on us not showing up. Yeah, without a doubt. We, we know that there's power that's associated with our vote. Resources are tied to our vote. And in the conversation we're having here now about the supporting of our academic institutions. So you, you got to get engaged. You've got to hold people accountable. When people are on the campaign trail, you should be raising the questions to them about where do you stand on support for HBCUs and actually hear what they have to say and then hold them accountable both Democrats and Republicans and independents, if that's what's going on in your respective states. Um, because if we don't utilize our vote in this moment, then we will lose our institutions. And Roland, this is how I know it's true. Because in West Virginia, at one time, you had five HBCUs. And now what you have is West Virginia State, which is still labeled as an HBCU. Uh, but the dynamics have changed. They're not saying that it's not still a good uh, educational institution, but it is so easy 
to end up losing Make our schools right now. Uh, we'll come back with more on Roller Mart Unfiltered uh, right here on, on the Black. So, so one second, we'll be right back. We gotta pay some bills. We'll be right back on the Black Star Network live from Los Angeles. This is NAACP Image Awards Week, and uh, don't forget, folks, support us. What we do? Download our app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can now watch us on Amazon News. You go to Amazon Fire, click Amazon News. The other networks are there. You can watch us as well. Uh, and we've got some great announcements coming up with some new platforms. We'll be out. We'll, we'll, you'll see our 24 7 streaming channel on as well. We'll be right back. We talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it. And you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people and i gotta tell you there are a whole bunch of black folk right that are that are the creators right the head writers right the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths the people don't really want to have this conversation no they don't What's up, y'all? I'm Will Packer. Hello, I'm Bishop T.D. J. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Rolling Martin Unfiltered. Music. back to Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, on uh, the Black Star Network. Um, let's talk California Senate race. We're here in Los Angeles. Uh, Barbara Lee of the Bay Area uh, has announced that she is going to run for the U.S. Senate being vacated by uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein. No one is rolling out the welcome mat, especially for someone like me. I was the girl they didn't allow in, who couldn't drink from the water fountain, who had an abortion in a back alley when they all were illegal. I escaped a violent marriage, became a single mom, a homeless mom, a mom who couldn't afford childcare and brought her kids to class with her. They didn't want to hear my voice or anyone who wasn't like them, but by the grace of God, I didn't let that stop me. To do nothing has never been an option for me. When my high school said cheerleaders couldn't be black, I took them on. 
I worked with the NAACP and earned my spot as, guess what, the school's first black cheerleader. When there were protections for survivors of domestic violence, I wrote California's first Violence Against Women Act. When it was legal to discriminate against the LGBTQ plus community, I wrote the Hate Crimes Reduction Act and got a Republican governor to sign it into law. When no one wanted to talk about global AIDS funding, I got President George W. Bush to make it a priority. And for those who say my time has passed, well, when does making change go out of style? I don't quit. I don't give up. Come on. That's not in my DNA. I didn't quit when I refused to give the president completely unlimited war powers after September 11th and in the face of countless death threats. I was the only no vote. I didn't quit then and I won't quit now. We have to ease the burden on the middle class. We have to find a solution to poverty and homelessness. We have to take on the climate crisis. And we have to stop these mega extremists who think they can control people's bodies and dismantle our democracy. And even though there are no African-American women in the United States Senate, we won't let that stop us either. Because when you stand on the side of justice, you don't quit if they don't give you a seat at the table. You bring a folding chair for everyone, and they're here to stay. All right, folks, uh, now understand Representative Katie Porter has already announced that she is running. Uh, also, uh, Representative Adam Schiff has announced that he is running. Representative Barbara Lee, she's served uh, in the House since 1998. Uh, let's talk about this uh, again with our panel. Uh, Candace, uh, you first. Uh, look, it's going to be a very expensive race. We're talking about California, statewide. Uh, Representative Lee has to raise a lot of money. Um, your thoughts, again, on what is shaping up to be uh, a contentious race. Uh, these U.S. Senate seats don't come open a lot. Uh, and uh, a lot of people thought that she should have been appointed as the vice president Kamala Harris uh, went to the White House. But, but your take on this, uh, the poss this race now with Representative Barbara Lee officially in it. You know what? I think that this is excellent because I'm a true fan of Ms. Barbara Lee. Uh, comes from Barbara Lee. And then what I like about her is that she's a change agent. This is someone who actually been in the trenches. This is someone who can actually identify with people that look like us. So if she was to go in, in uh, the Senate, this would be amazing. It would be amazing. And then what I love about this woman, what I love about her is that she gives me that hope. She gives me that drive as a black woman that I can do this. And you know what? I think that she's going to do it. That's how I feel. Uh, Mustafa, um, again, there are no black women in the United States Senate. Uh, and then that has been a point of contention for a lot of sisters uh, since uh, the vice president uh, was elected. Well, that says something about our country when you know, black women are not in the Senate, not helping to, to frame out a new and positive direction. We know that when they are, the Senate is a better place. It is a more effective place. Barbara Lee, you know, she's a... I, I really love Barbara Lee because she's always fought for vulnerable communities. She doesn't play around. She makes sure that she gets the job done. How, housing, health care um, are a couple of the issues that I know that she's cared about. She was there when we were working on environmental justice. When I worked on Capitol Hill, she always showed up. Um, so she would be an excellent, an excellent uh, new member uh, on the Senate. So I'm looking forward to it. But like you said, it's going to take a lot of money. And that means that folks are going to have to get out and support her if you believe in the work that she's always done and can do. Candace, one of the things that we've heard from African-Americans who run statewide uh, is they don't get enough financial support uh, from the Democratic Party apparatus from these various PACs. Again, that is going to be an issue uh, because, again, it's going to be an expensive primary, uh, and that's what it boils down to. And to run statewide in California, you've got to have a lot of money 
to run on a lot of expensive TV markets. Well, you know what? That's exactly how it is in Texas as well. So basically, you have to get behind the person who you want your democracy to represent. So in so many words, she's got to have to have a war chest. And she's going to have to have donors. She's going to have to have those packs. So if California wants her to represent them in the Senate, they got to get together and they got to make this money because that's what's going to win elections. And this is a very expensive race because we see it all the time here in Texas. That right there, uh, Mustafa, again, money, money, money. Uh, and so uh, Democrats will be duking it out. But it's interesting, though, how do you see this race in terms of, okay, who you're appealing to? Uh, and so who can out progressive progressives? <laughs> well, nobody's going to out progress uh, Barbara Lee. She's always been out there on the front lines on some of the most important issues. I remember when she stood up you know, uh, against us going to war. Um, so uh, when the other folks kind of got some pressure and, and shrunk to the background, if you will. But let's, you know, when we're talking about money, you know, Barber League going to make sure that the, both the barbershops and the beauty salons and those folks are actually activated and are out supporting her. But we also got a whole lot of folks there in that, in that big industry that we call Hollywood um, who are also going to have to make some decisions. So if you say that you want to support the changes that are necessary in our country, then those actors and actresses and uh, producers and editors, you know, then you're going to have to make sure that you're also putting your dollars where your words are. So that's another pot of money um, that folks will be vying for. And, um, you know, she should be one of the top candidates that folks are wanting to support in a financial way. Uh, Candace, uh, I also expect um, a lot of black women nationally uh, to really be invested in this race because uh, not having an African-American woman in the United States Senate uh, is a problem. Folks were hoping that Sherry Beasley was going to be uh, elected in North Carolina. She wasn't. Uh, and so a lot of hopes are going to be placed on Barbara Lee securing the nomination for the Democratic nomination to go to the general election. Right. And you're absolutely right about that, because you got to keep in mind, this here is a very serious, serious position that we need another African-American woman in that Senate. So they have to strategize. They have to be able to galvanize. And then at the end of the day, the, the, it, it boils down to you have to have the war chest. You have to have it, because if not, then it's going to be an issue. And then by her being in California, just like uh, Brother said, uh, you have all of these actors, celebrities, and things like that. So you need to get behind her. You need to put your money as to what you want your democracy to look like. And that's my take on it. Well, absolutely. And so I think, folks, what we are seeing uh, is going to be uh, a very, very, very uh, difficult uh, race. Of course, uh, Senator Barbara Lee, she had tweeted, Today, I'm proud to announce my candidacy for U.S. Senate. I've never backed down from doing what's right, and I never will. Californians deserve a strong, progressive leader who has delivered a real change. And so, like I said, she, served on, she currently serves on the uh, U.S. House Budget and Appropriations Committee. Uh, that's uh, always important when you talk about uh, states. It's, all about, it's always about uh, who has the money uh, and who uh, can access uh, the money. And so uh, that's what's uh, happening there. All right, folks. A uh, lot of more news to talk about. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, this uh, Intuit study dealing with black businesses. Also talk about the Supreme Court hearing a case dealing with Google uh, as well. So a lot to unpack. Don't forget to support us in what we do. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support what we do. Check in money order. Go to, go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Don't forget to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available at all bookstores. Download a copy on Audible as well. We'll be right back. Next on Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach. Listen to this. Women of color are starting 90% of the businesses in this country. That's the good news. The bad news, as a rule, we're not making nearly as much as everyone else. 
But joining us on the next Get Wealthy episode is Betty Hines. She's a business strategist, and she's showing women how to elevate other women. I don't like to say this openly, but we're getting better at it. Women struggle with collaborating with each other. And for that reason, one of the things that I demonstrate in the uh, sessions that I have is that you can go further together if you collaborate. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. An hour of living history with Dr. Richard Mariba Kelsey, thinker, builder, author, and one of the most important and impactful elders in the African-American community. He reflects on his full and rich life and shares his incomparable wisdom about our past, present, and future. African genius is, is, is saying that my uncle was a genius, my brother was a genius, my neighbor was a genius. I think we ought to drill that in ourselves and move ahead rather than believing that I got it. That's next on The Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm L.D. Barge. Hey, yo, Peace World. What's going on? It's the Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. Welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered, broadcasted live here in Los Angeles. According to a news, uh, new data from Intuit, black entrepreneurs uh, are facing more difficulty starting a viable business. The financial management surveyed 1,000 black business owners to share their small business struggles and successes. Uh, the survey revealed, on average, it costs approximately $21,000 to start a business compared to $16,000. Um, um, 57% said... Um, 57 percent uh, said uh, that they were denied bank loans at least once. Uh, 34 percent. Well, first of all, I don't understand. Um, I, I'm assuming that when it, co when it comes to, to starting the business, that's black to white. The graphic should say that. I don't know what it costs approximately 21 grand to start their business compared to 16,000 of what. So, guys, get the graphic right. Uh, 34 percent report being denied a bank loan more than once, twice the amount. 36% did not understand the various loan and grant options available. 79% had to pay expenses or employees with personal funds at least once in the last two years. Dr. Dr. Jacqueline King is the founder of Black Women Empowered uh, from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, Dr. King, glad to have you here. Look, look, look here's the deal. First of all, um, the, the Intuit study is not new. It's not like it's giving us any uh, new data here. Uh, but, but the reality is, I dare say, when we talk about our businesses, we talk about growing our businesses, it's not always a question of access to capital. It's also access to contracts, um, being able to grow that way. That also is critically important. Absolutely. You're correct. And, and you know, 
Um, first of all, I want to say congratulations to Barbara Lee. That's amazing news. But um, yeah, so even even down to the ARPA funds, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that, I mean, when you go there and it's supposed to be for uh, un, unprivileged uh, communities or low-income communities, but the cities, the local cities are doing what they want to with the money. A lot, I'm hearing it. I have a Linda Gray who is, works with me and my nonprofit. Um, she's hearing it over and over and the, the funds are just not coming to the people who it's supposed to be for. So it's not just the bank loans. This is the way uh, the, the local communities are governing as well. So if we're talking about, uh, and I think you see efforts in Congress trying to uh, make some changes to that, uh, and, and, and look, what has to happen is the pressure has to be put on these banks because, again, when we're locked out of contracts and we're locked out of resources, you can't grow, you can't build, you have no capacity. That is absolutely. Um, so we can, we can uh, unify. That's the, the biggest thing, and I love what I heard uh, someone say just a few minutes ago. Uh, I think it was you, collaboration. If we don't come together... And, and make decisions as a group, we're not going to patronize your bank because you don't give money to the black communities. We're never gonna, we're never gonna overcome this obstacle. Um, uh, March 1st, I'm gonna be doing a, a two hour show dealing with uh, the lack of contracts uh, and what, how we're getting frozen out by these companies and these ad agencies and breaking it down in a very specific way. And that's what it boils down to. I was talking to somebody and I said, look, I said, our business, I said, we've been, we said, we're profitable. Uh, we're in the black. Uh, I'm not trying to run out and raise investor money or trying to, get, I, don't, I don't want a bank loan because we can pay our bills. What we need are contracts. And so what's happening is we're in a perfect position, but we get screwed by these folks. And it, that's also what's happening. When we're frozen out of the deal flow, then we don't, we're not able to truly grow. So even when you create a successful black owned business, if you're not getting the contracts, you can't go anywhere. Do you know, I found out when I was a commissioner in North Carolina that the way these contracts happen in many cases is that uh, it's a, 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 if I can just be real, we're unfiltered. A white man will get his wife who is now a minority a woman and a minority owned business, he will put the business in her name so she can get the contract and compete with the black woman, the black man. But that's how they do it. They go back door. And so, yeah, we got to come up with other solutions to get the money and the contracts. Uh, questions. Uh, Mustafa, you first. Yeah, my, well, my question is, uh, how do you think uh, the best way for us to educate our communities on these sets of hurdles and then also bringing forward how folks have been able uh, to navigate them and, and to be able to move in a positive direction? And that's what Black Women in Power does. So we've been uh, together for 11 years, and that's what we do. We educate on finances, how to get contracts, how to get... Uh, the money through through grants and loans and but but really it takes us working together i can't emphasize enough collaboration and that's where we struggle we struggle coming together and saying okay if we if, if we can get this contract together um we have a better chance five ten of us apply for the contract together not one individual so it's it's really education and and believing that we can come together and working on coming together to get the contracts. Candace. Okay, so I'm a business owner here in uh, Houston, Texas, and I also have a business in Beaumont. I own a foster adoption agency. And so what we get contracts that's directly from the state and also the federal government. And so what I have uncovered when it comes to dealing with the disparities is that systemic racism raise his ugly head in this process. And so what they do, I didn't caught them to where they have forged compliance history, to where they trying to make minority providers to make us obsolete by 
finding us all of these fines to where now your business is going to go in the red. So it's it's a lot of factors with this, and I am very steadfast on it. So what is your take on how can we deal with this in this type of capacity? Because in my opinion, I believe in legislation, agitation, and litigation. You come over here and mess with my business, I'm going to sue your behind. What is your take? And, and that that's why we need... Uh women and men in in the government that look like us. Uh, it was very disappointing that Cheryl Beasley didn't get uh, in the Senate. But we don't even come together to support our own, and let alone worrying about, uh, you know, what the, the Democratic PAC is doing. We can't even come together to say, yeah, we're all going to pull and support this person. You don't have to live in the same state to, to support them monetarily. We can do that. Uh, like Roland said, it's going to take a lot of money. It doesn't matter where the money is com coming from. But if we want to get them elected, everybody's going to have to chip in. Uh, well, absolutely. And, and I think we also have got to have a segment called Where's Our Money? We also have got to put pressure on policymakers to understand how do they also free the contracts up. Because on the federal level, we're only getting 1.67% of all federal contracts. Yo, I mean, I'm sorry, that's unacceptable. And the deal is, if you're not getting federal contracts, you're not getting corporate contracts. So then we're always frozen and stuck making small money. I agree. But <laughs> as you know, in this era, they don't really care. I mean, what kind of pressure are you talking about? They don't care what we do. This is this has been improved after after Donald Trump. They basically said, do whatever you want to do. We're going to do what we want to do. So, I mean, I don't have the answer on how to put pressure on on the government. I, I don't. I do. Well, I please do. tell me. And that tell is me. Well, 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 well here, here, here's, here's first and foremost, black caucuses on the state level have got to be far more aggressive when it comes to forcing uh, these folks to change the rules when it comes to contracts. If you, first of all, you're not breaking down an analysis of who's not getting what, then you don't know what to do. Then you can't, then you can't actually impact it. Uh, so I've been doing that and challenging the Biden administration, challenging the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, saying, look, it's ridiculous on the advertising side. Black-owned media is getting 1% of federal advertising contracts. And so you, you can create changes by being able to put pressure on the system and telling policymakers, you want our votes, but we ain't getting contracts. You better make sure we get some more damn, damn contracts or somebody else is going to get our vote. That's how we have to do it. But you cannot do that if you are not organized and mobilized. And and that's why, and, and for, really, you probably don't remember, I reached out to you on Clubhouse and said, I need you to come on my uh, network because that's what we need. We need your voice out here telling the people what they need to do to get these contracts. I mean, I, who else is doing it besides you? That's why we do it. Well, here's the deal. I can't control what other people do. Uh, that's why I built this show, built this network, and why we do it. And so that, you know, that, that, that's, that's how, I talk, how, how I talk about it uh, and keep pushing it. Uh, but again, uh, it's real easy to say, oh, man, good, let's start a business. But that's part of the problem. We have a bunch of small businesses with one employee. We need build bigger capacity. That's what we need. Dr. Dr. King, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We'll be back right back. Roland Martin on Filter of the Black Star Network. Don't forget on YouTube, hit the like button you're watching. Hit the share button on Facebook. Uh, same thing on the Black Star Network app. Uh, and again, folks, support us in what we do. Download the app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And then, of course, uh, you can also uh, support us by joining our Brina Funk fan club. See, check in money orders, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered, Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zell, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. 
As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, a relationship that we have to have. We're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it. That's right. We're talking about our relationship with money. And here's the thing. Our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not. The truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge. Balancing your relationship with your pocketbook. That's next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Gavin Houston. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. E Folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. The U.S. Supreme Court, folks, uh, they are um, uh, looking at a, a, a case uh, dealing with Google um, relates to uh, content. They heard arguments today about allowing websites to be sued for the automatic recommendations of user content. For nearly three hours, Supreme Court Justice Paterno has presented their case uh, to hold Google accountable for suggesting YouTube videos created by terrorist groups. The case stems from the death of Nohemi Gonzalez, an American college student killed in a terrorist attack in Paris. The family wants to sue Google, whose YouTube algorithms they blame for helping extremists spread their message and attract new recruits, social analysts, uh, and diversity strategist Shereen Mitchell is here to break this thing down. Uh, so, Shereen, um, okay, for the average black person out there, why does this, why does this matter? Um, it, it matters because we're having this conversation about algorithms once again, right? Like, what are the algorithms doing? How does it impact our lives and the spaces in between? What is happening with these cases, and by the way, there are two cases. Google was today, Twitter is tomorrow. Um, in reference to the way in which the algorithms uh, present content to you. I think most people think that when they're gi given that um, suggestion to go on to other content, particularly on YouTube, that that suggestion 
is about the fact that like Google is suggesting it to you. Google is is, is algorithms is presenting this additional content and, and allowing people to do horrific things based on what the content is that that um, that is being presented. In the case today, uh, what what's also being argued is actually Section 230. Section 230 is very complicated, but what Section 230 originally is about is that it gives immunity to the technology platforms if it's a third-party uh, content being produced. So me, as a user, sharing content gives the platform immunity from what I share, and that if anyone needs to be responsible, it's me sharing it. What this case is arguing is that immunity should be changed based on the fact that, that if the algorithms are suggesting content, that they are liable for the suggestion. Okay. And so, and so with that, um, again, suing, suing them, they're obviously in control of the algorithm. But it's also based upon a lot of times what users are talking about, and so yes. this could be applied to anything. It could, it could be applied uh, to sex or whatever. Exactly, and that's why it's important because the ways in which uh, if, if every, anyone who goes onto Google and looks at one image, one video, right? If uh, I go to the Daily Show, oh wait, the Roland Martin Show. And then I get suggestions for other shows that Roland Martin has had. Um, that is part of the algorithm because that is part of the suggestions. Yet at the end of the day, I am probably interested in more shows that Roland Martin may be doing. However, what they're saying is that if you're then being suggested, um, like uh, to, to go to a, a a website or a video or an ad that is about anything that would disparage you, the show, or allow anyone else to think about doxing or terrorizing you or your team, then the company is then liable. And that's the part that I think that they're trying to argue. So the the one today was in Paris, the one tomorrow was in Instabul. In, in uh, and and, and the, the challenge that they're arguing is I am a third party person if I share content and those companies are completely uh, ab absolved from anything that includes whether or not they are using their news feeds or their algorithms or anything like that in a different way that keeps these suggestions coming up that can be harmful or can lead people to do harm against themselves, by the way, as well as commit harms against other people. And when we look at this, it's the, the question is, like what happened with Facebook. Is Facebook responsible for the massacre that happened in, in, in Rohingya if they were the ones that did not take down that content and people actually used it and something bad happened? Or are we asking the question that that content that, that, that I'm sharing should be moderated enough that there is no harm that gets inflicted. And I think it's the moderation part, it's the Section 230 part that I think we're dancing this really fine line about. Because if, if, the, if Section 230 is removed and these companies are accused of um, participating in these harms, then we're, we're actually talking about different liability suits, we're talking about different lawsuits. The Twitter conversation tomorrow is that they are actually trying to take the Section 230 conversation a little bit further down the distance and says, but were we igniting or pro promoting or participating in this harm? And the company is saying, we if we're not doing it, and it's, a, and it's you, it's you, it's the content provider, that's where it should sit and that's where it should be the responsibility. But if we if we take the blame, if the tech companies now take the blame, they're they're su they're, they're worried about any any possible lawsuits and other aspects. So today I would say both sides of the um of the of the justices kind of agree on how this line is being pushed a little bit too far. Um Look, it, it is. Uh, look, we're, we're living in a world now 
where we are going to we're increasingly controlled by the algorithm. Uh, and look, I know for a fact that on Facebook, black content is getting blocked. Uh, it's ri ridiculous how uh, our numbers are being suppressed. Uh, I've emailed them numerous times. They're not responding because what Facebook wants to do is to force you to spend money uh, boosting boosting your um, to your own followers uh, as opposed to you having access to them. And so we see what the game is. And so uh, whenever they change the algorithm, it can have a direct impact on money that is generated by content providers as well. I mean, they are in control of it. And when you have companies like Facebook and Google that control so much of the advertising business, that's one of the reasons why the Biden administration is considering suing them over their uh, over, the, over their monopoly practices. And that's and that's exactly right. Like the, the challenge that we're having is that on one end, they are using and manipulating their algorithms because we've had that testimony from from uh, Hogan who showed that, like, they knew that the algorithm was doing something different when it came to protecting white users versus protecting black users on the platform. And this argument is sort of about that. It's like, if you're going to institute an algorithm and it has a biased outcome, what, at that point, is the responsibility? If And, and today, actually, in those three hours, that came up. If someone is intentionally creating the algorithm to change what your feed is and to protect certain users versus not protecting others, then that in itself is something that we should be talking about. That manipulation is intentional. And honestly, we just had that, right? On Sunday, right? Um, you know, I don't call him by his real name, so forgive me, y'all. Apartheid Kai got upset that Biden had more traction during uh, Super Bowl um, and, and Super Bowl halftime. So he pulled in his staff and someone created con created an um, algorithm so that his content was now dominant. That action, that action is what these lawsuits should be about, is that if that is actually being done, then yes, then, then then the platforms are liable for whatever happens. And the question now is, are we seeing that? Is that actually happening? Or are we dealing with the fact that, like, the, um, they're not doing enough of their own curation and their own um, monitoring of the terms of service to prevent from harmful things happening? Or, or are they creating algorithms that are biased and causing, one, causing harm, but two, giving people more access or more platform than others and then forcing people, like everyday people, to have to pay to have the same kind of boosting? Are they also s removing groups? Like, Because, for example, my organization, we can't boost at all. Like, like we, if anything that we put out on Facebook has to go out through our general audience because we can't even pay for boosting. And when you make decisions like that, that just says that there's some other issues that we need to be paying attention to because that decision is being made by the organization, by the platform, not because of the content, but because they're making the decision about whether or not they even want that content out. All right, Shereen, we shall appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, uh, got to pay some bills. I'll be back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Don't forget, uh, support us by downloading our app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also uh, support us by sending a check and money order, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal or Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. And, of course, you can get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available on all platforms, including on Audible. And don't forget, we're on Amazon News. You can watch us on Amazon Fire TV. Click Amazon News. If you want to hear our content, you get Alexa. Simply say, Alexa, play the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. An hour of living history with Dr. Richard Mariba Kelsey, thinker, builder, author, and one of the most important and impactful elders in the African-American community. He reflects on his full and rich life and shares his incomparable wisdom about our past, 
present and future. I'm a genius is saying that my uncle was a genius, my brother was a genius, my neighbor was a genius. I think we ought to drill that in ourselves and move ahead rather than believing that I got it. That's next on The Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Jeffers has been missing from Phoenix, Arizona since January 15th. The 17-year-old is 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighs 130 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about Rhea Jeffers is urged to call the Phoenix Police Department at 602-262-6151. 602-262-6151. Folks, one of the Arkansas officers of a uh, caught violently arresting a man on video will not face charges. State appointed Special Prosecutor Emily White says the state is not pursuing charges against Mulberry Police Officer Thale Riddle, one of the three officers involved in the August 22 arrest of Randall Worcester. Riddle was back at work on the force as of February 17th. The investigations of the incident remains ongoing. Former Crawford County Sheriff's Deputies Levi White and Zach King are still on investigation for slamming a slamming uh, Walter's head on the ground while restrained. The two deputies have been fired and charged with civil rights violations. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is on a political tour, folks, with stops in Pennsylvania, New York, and Illinois, basically his anti-crime tour. He headlined the event called Law and Order, Florida Leading the Way. Uh, candidates for mayor denounces the visit, including Paul Vallis, who accepted the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police endorsement. Now, after leaving uh, Illinois, DeSantis went to New York. New York City Mayor Eric Adams took shots at DeSantis, a special guest for a conservative law enforcement event. Adams offered to teach DeSantis some of the city's progressive values on Twitter. Uh, let's go to my panel here. Look, the reality is here, DeMario. Ron DeSantis is going to try to make crime a major issue. This is about pushing the button of white fear. Always good to see everybody. Always. That's what uh, white supremacists have always done. They've always tried to say crime and that something's wrong with us and they have to bring out the police and the army and vicious vigilance to keep us in line. So there's no question about it. But I, you know, Ron DeSantis is, is um, a smarter guy than Trump. He has a little, uh, but he has less charisma than Trump. So it's going to be interesting to see how he gets out outside of Florida and how his message plays, even though we know white supremacy and white domination always plays well to, unfortunately, the majority of white population. Um, Mustafa, the thing here is, again, we see what's going on, and they believe, oh, we can ride this uh, into uh, the White House based upon what happened in the 2022 midterm elections. Yeah, this is Ron DeSantis' uh, White House tour. That's what he should call it, a pre-White House tour. You know, it's really interesting. Ron DeSantis didn't say anything about the folks who were breaking the law on January the 6th. He didn't say anything when President Trump was breaking the law with consistency around the clock. And there are a number of other examples of where his voice has been silent. But whenever he can highlight what, you know, he thinks is black or brown folks, um, then he jumps all over that. So we know who he is. He's shown us who he is. 
Um, and folks in Florida and across the country should pay attention. As Mario said, he is someone who may end up being uh, the Republican candidate for president. So um, pay attention, get engaged, and speak out and push back um, against this foolishness that he continues to try and propagate. Uh, and Candace, look, Democrats are going to have to learn how to properly respond and not run out of fear. Mm-hmm. But you know what, Roland, let me tell you what this jack leg white supremacist over here is doing. He is doing nothing but going straight out of the Ronald Reagan playbook. That's exactly what he's doing. Because just like how you brought about the white fear, right? That's exactly what Ronald Reagan did, and that is exactly what Donald Trump did by bestowing fear in these white supremacists. You understand what I'm saying? And so when you do that, then this is what you get. This guy is one of the ones that's waging war on coach on our cultural education. This is somebody that is raging war on our wokeness. This is somebody that is very dangerous, that don't need to be in the White House. He need to be in the doggone psychiatric hospital. Uh, let's talk about um, Georgia, where a panel has recommended there are a number of people uh, be indicted in the election fraud case. They have been looking at Donald Trump uh, and so many others. A uh, report was released uh, detailing um, what should be done. And again, this special grand jury, uh, Mustafa, uh, has recommended uh, a number of folks uh, be, be um, prosecuted. Uh, the forewoman, Emily uh, Coors, told the New York Times that uh, it is not a short list of people who should be charged with crimes. Your thoughts? Well, we know, you know, you just have to put the facts together um, to to sort of highlight these individuals who have been doing all kinds of nefarious things um, around democracy. And and now, you know, uh, folks are pulling it forward. Uh, People are going to be held accountable, and, and we'll see how it all plays out. But they love to try and you know, put a spotlight on on somebody who voted who may not have known if they were allowed to. Uh, But these are individuals who have made conscious efforts uh, in this space uh, to to really just to hurt or destroy democracy. But they're not as concerned about democracy as they are their power. Um, And and what they're really trying to do is hold on to power, hold on to resources, and they understand that that is tied to the vote. Um, So they get exactly what's coming to them. Uh, for the things that they've done in the past. Uh, the thing here, uh, Candace, when we look at this here, I mean, look, it, it's going to come down to D.A. Fannie Willis. She's going to make the decision. And at some point, one of these D.A.s is going to have to have some guts and go after Donald Trump. Mayor Garland hasn't done it so far. Uh, the, the D.A. in Manhattan hasn't done it. The man continues to get away scot-free, never held accountable. But you know what? And and that's done by design. See, this is what is important when they when, when we say the statement election has consequences. Because when you turn around and you put people in office, you need people that's going to be in office that's not going to be afraid to make the tough decisions. That's going to put people over politics. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not what we get here. And so, in my position is this: if you tamper with my democracy, you do the crime, you do the time. And if you have all the facts, you have everything to show exactly this is what this person doing. Well, D.A., what's your problem? Put them charges and let's get on with this. What you think, Roland? DeMario, somebody has to have some courage to lead. Otherwise, listen, the man knows no bottom. So he's going to keep doing whatever the hell he wants. If I keep getting away with it, that's like saying, hey, we're never going to hold you accountable for robbing a bank. A bank robber going to keep robbing. Yeah. I wish my sister Candace was there in one of these DA offices. I, I, I like her. I like you, Candace. Listen, it's very dangerous because the more that this goes on month after month, that people are not held accountable, it makes them more powerful, more emboldened, and it makes us all less safe. We all know that there are black people doing 10, 20, 30 life sentences for one-tenth of one percent of what people like Donald Trump and even other individuals like Lindsey Graham. 
and other elected officials like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who actually participated not just in trying to steal votes, but the January 6th insurrection. And so each time this is punted down the line, it actually makes those individuals more powerful, more emboldened, and more dangerous. So I'm hoping that the DA down there in uh, Atlanta, uh, black woman, and many times black women have come and done way more for this country than they ever should have based upon how black women have been treated. So hopefully this black woman was falling on in that tremendous line of black women who have saved and done the right thing when others would not do it. Uh, and, and again, uh, Mustafa here, we're talking about multiple. This grand jury is saying that multiple indictments being recommended. That means a lot of people were involved in this fraud. Listen to that fool, Donald Trump. Oh, without a doubt. You know, it's almost like a, a crime family when you actually look at all the different types of individuals who are part of this. And it's not just in Georgia. We know that it's been going on in a number of other states also. So Georgia has the opportunity to set the pace, if you will, for what needs to actually happen. Um, and then hopefully it will, uh, you know, ensure that others won't follow down this path again and try and destroy democracy and actually try and take away, you know, black and brown folks uh, when they show up at the polls in high numbers, our opportunity to make sure that democracy is working for everyone. Uh, again, so we're, you know, we're, lo we're looking at uh, all of this, uh, you know, that, that is going on. And, and, I, and I tell you, Candace, um, all across the country, um, you got elections next year. And, and at some point, these D, uh, the D is going to have some courage. Because I'm sick of hearing, oh, what, how is his, his supporters going to respond? I thought the sign above the Supreme Court says equal justice under law. <laughs> you know what, Roland? Let me tell you something. <laughs> See, this is when your black caucuses, this is where your black collectives and all of these people need to come into play and hold them accountable. And I mean, like, chain, like grab that chain and be like, hey, let's not forget who put you in this office. You sit up here and let these people play with our democracy. I guarantee we're going to turn around and we're going to fire you at the polls. See, we have to be aggressive when it comes to dealing with this stuff. We have to let these people know, baby, you got the wrong one. The wrong one. So I guess, Demario, you don't believe equal justice under law actually exists. Oh, I know it doesn't exist. Laugh. I know it doesn't exist. I mean, I work in a space here for single day, and I know it doesn't exist. And we all know it doesn't exist. And it's shown. That's the that's the that's kind of the the tr it's the tragedy of Donald Trump that he brought out so much of the underlying dis discrimination and racism and hatred that has been there. But he brought it to the forefront. That's the real negative of Donald Trump. But the positive side of Donald Trump, as far as trying to move our society truly to a more equal place, is that he's really exposing how unequal things are. That's, you were talking about De Governor DeSantis. This guy, while he's up running around talking about crime, he himself committed multiple federal crimes by taking immigrants, kidnapping them, and putting them on a plane and sending them to people's homes in Massachusetts and other places. But it shows that these individuals, we don't have an equal system. We have a two-tiered system, as my mentor Brian Stevenson would say. It's much better to be white and rich than to be uh, a poor or black in, Amer in America. Now, we all know that, but we see it so clearly with how Trump and his cronies are being protected. Look what's going on at Fox News. These guys have been exposed to intentionally giving out disinformation, falsities, lies, and yet the FEC has not come in and shut them down. They should have been shut down, period. They are a news organization that has proven and have admitted to lying to their audience to make money, but they're not shut down. So it shows our society is unequal, and we have to continue to push in everything we can to get that equality under law that it's always said we were supposed to have. All right, folks, so tight. One second, we'll be back on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Uh, well, YouTube, hit that like button. We should be easily at more than 1,000 likes on the YouTube channel. Uh, also, folks, uh, share on Facebook and the other platforms as well. Don't forget, download our app. We want to get to 100,000 downloads. We surpassed 50,000. Let's get to 100,000. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And, of course, if you have Amazon Fire TV, go to the Amazon News 
You can actually, you can see us, uh, our 24 Hours channel, along with the other channels out there. That's right. We're right next to MSNBC, uh, CNN, all those networks. So support the Black Star Network on Amazon News. I'll be right back. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rolling. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Next on Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, listen to this. Women of color are starting 90% of the businesses in this country. That's the good news. The bad news, as a rule, we're not making nearly as much as everyone else. But joining us on the next Get Wealthy episode is Betty Hines. She's a business strategist, and she's showing women how to elevate other women. I don't like to say this openly, but we're getting better at it. Women struggle with collaborating with each other. And for that reason, one of the things that I demonstrate in the uh, sessions that I have is that you can go further together if you collaborate. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hi, I'm B.B. Winans. Hi, I'm Kim Burrell. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, everybody, this is Sherry Shepard. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. And while he's doing Unfiltered, I'm practicing the wobble. <laughs> Welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, live from Los Angeles. Rising home prices 
has caused a lot of people to look at alternatives uh, when it comes to housing. A Georgia developer has created quite the unique uh, pathway. Uh, and so we're going to be talking to him. Uh, we'll be talking to him uh, in a second uh, about the issue of um, uh, micro home communities. I really want to know what the hell that means. Uh, but first, let's talk about what's happening. Uh, that's going to be in our marketplace segment. Uh, let's talk about what's happening in Nevada. Well, a video of a Nevada police officer slamming a student for recording police uh, has gone viral. A Clark County School District police officer was captured on cell phone video slamming a, Durang slamming a Durango High School student to the ground and pinning him underneath his knee. This took place on February 9th when officers arrived to investigate a firearm report near the school. Uh, roll it. I heard it a little bit right there. Um, of course, uh, following the incident, the school district launched an investigation. Clark County Superintendent called for a complete review of the police department's use of force policy. Joining us now uh, is Athar uh, Hasebula. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Executive Director of the ACLU in Nevada. They've been quite vocal about this incident and holding the officers accountable. So, uh, just so Athar, I'm, I'm, so I'm trying to understand here: were these officers? They were in the school, or officers that arrived at the school. Did it happen at a school, or was it near a school, this so-called firearm uh, report near the school? Um, hey, thanks for having us on, Frat. Uh, alpha Phi Alpha all day. But um, this incident uh, specifically um, happened outside of a school. Uh, and in Nevada, we have school police. Um, so we have separate police departments here. One of the police departments that exists in Clark County is the Clark County uh, School District's police department. Um, so CCSD police, um, they have jurisdiction over certain elements related to incidents in school. This whole entire notion of a firearm is what the, the district put out afterwards. I think it was done to clean up. We still have no idea what they're talking about. Um, in terms of a firearm, none of our um, we're actually representing uh, two of the students that were uh, shown being uh, assaulted by Clark County School District police there. Um, and the firearm story, you know, who knows? Uh, I know our clients did not have any firearms. Um, there was no basis to even stop them, let alone attack them. Um, we're disgusted by the fact that the district first, these officers and the officer most prevalently that slammed one of our clients to the ground. Um, is still employed, and the district attorney's office hasn't even bothered to investigate this yet. So we have called for that officer's termination, and we've called for the DA's office to investigate this as they would any incident of assault. I mean, I, what, what is strange here, again, I mean, you're seeing um, uh, how these police are responding, uh, and uh, it, it's just, it, it always just keeps happening uh, where, uh, look, uh, how they respond in these school situations uh, in, in very much uh, a very violent manner. I mean, again, dragging this person, slamming their head, and I'm up, their head is nearly under the, under, I mean, under the, the base of the car. Yeah, and, and it's a child. You know, that's the, that's the thing is that anytime it's a, you know, a white kid who's 19 or, or a young adult, they'll refer to him as a child. Um, and these are you know, these are students who are at the very beginning of their high school careers, and they're being assaulted by police. And what happens when we see students like this assaulted? I mean, this is an assault on video. Where is our district attorney? Uh, ACLU is not the district attorney. We're here to seek justice, and we'll do that through civil means, but where is our district attorney? They have the ability to investigate this. They gave a statement on Friday after pressure uh, from our office um, and from the NAACP here, um, where we called for the DA to investigate this, and their response was, 
if the Clark County School District police refer this for prosecution, they'll look into it. So basically, refer yourself for prosecution and we'll look into it, which has never been the legal standard. It's never been the legal standard. There's no courage out of that office. They need to speak up and do something. Certainly, they have the time to prosecute kids for you know, holding a dime bag of cannabis um, or for, for missing school or you know, parents involved in a domestic squabble. But when it comes to a vicious assault that's recorded on video um, where school police are attacking a child, there's no courage to stand up and do anything about it. Uh, that's what we continue to see all the time, DeMario, uh, where trying to hold cops accountable and you're dealing with DAs who frankly are in bed with them. Each and every day, um, they make cases based upon the testimony of officers. So it's an inherent conflict of interest, something that we have fought for for decades, trying to take the, the prosecution of police officers or even the investigation of police officers away from themselves, the police, and away from the DA's officers that work with them each and every day. You don't have to even be a corrupt person to have a difficult time investigating or prosecuting individuals that you work with. So it just makes our system, again, not an equal justice under the law, because these are friends of each other. You know, I couldn't tell specifically on that video what the officer alleged the young man had done, but based upon what I saw, it appeared the young man just had a video, and it actually appeared he was walking away from the scene, and the officer ran up on a young man and grabbed him and put him on the ground. So I don't know what the issue is there for why that happened. I'm glad to see the ACLU is on board to try to get their family, as the executive director said, some civil justice, but civil justice is not criminal justice, and criminal justice can only come either from the DA's office or, I don't know how they do in Nevada, maybe the state attorney general's office can pick up and press charges. And of course, the DOJ could come in. If we had a more robust DOJ, if we had the type of funding for the DOJ Civil Rights Division that we give for, like, for instance, Ukraine, where we say we'll stand with them forever and we'll do whatever they need, and we've already sent them $100 billion, if we could get maybe 10 percent or 20 percent of what's been sent to Ukraine for enforcement of civil rights, where the Civil Rights Division can come out and prosecute these type of malicious, vicious attacks on young people and black people and innocent, unarmed people, maybe we can move towards that equal justice under law that we've been talking about all day on this show. So, 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 Demario, you're saying that the current DOJ is not doing that? I'm saying the current DOJ is not doing enough, right? Because they, the current DOJ is under under resourced, it's understaffed, it's underfunded. The DOJ Civil Rights Division is very underfunded. We need double, triple the amount of resources and lawyers and investigators for the civil rights violations that happen all over this country. See, the fact of the matter is we see these type of videos. We see what happened to Brother Tyree Nichols or in Memphis or what happened to George Floyd. But the reality is that that's happening each and every day all over this country. And many times people don't have the luxury of having someone videotaping it. And they don't have the luxury. Even there are many police departments departments in this country that don't have body cam or DAS cams. And these things are happening each and every day to people in our communities. And because these lo local police departments, they're not going to investigate themselves. The local prosecutors, they're not going to prosecute unless there is tremendous public outcry. But look how much energy it takes to have the type of outcry that we have in Tyree Nichols or Ahmaud Arbery or Botham John or any of those cases. That's just a fraction of what actually happens. But if we had a robust DOJ, a civil rights division that was properly staffed, properly funded, that could go out and bring the charges that are necessary across this nation, we could possibly have equal justice under the law. Until that happens, we will not, it will not be a reality. It's what you say, Roland, all the time. You got to have funding for black media. You got to have funding to fight these white supremacists. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I... No, no, I understand that. What, what, I, what, I'm, saying, what I'm saying is, again, uh, there's a difference between saying increased funding and they're not doing it, meaning more needs to be done. What we actually have here, Thar, is a DOJ that's been far more aggressive than, frankly, the Obama DOJ was. Uh, no question about that. There's no question they're far more aggressive, but it's still no, 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 scratching no, 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 the no, no, surface. No, 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 no. Demar Demario, 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 Demario. I'm asking Athar. Do Athar go ahead? Yeah, I yeah, no, I would say that, um, look, 
that there there has they have taken on more cases. Um, I, I don't know that that's been enough, right? Um, we've had DAs on occasion across the country who have taken on cases. It hasn't been enough. We have certain law enforcement officers that have stepped up and said certain officers, when they're engaged in excessive force and serious misconduct, um, they like to see those officers prosecuted, but it hasn't been enough. And so um, to, the, to the point that was made, uh, I do agree that, you know, whether it's a resource issue or, you know, it's the frequency of what's occurring, some of these some of these issues are problematic, and a lot of it's local. The DOJ is not going to step into every community to deal with every issue. Quite frankly, they, they'll never have enough resources to be able to do that. But really, um, in this case here in Nevada right now, as we're using this as an example, uh, we're going to push the issue as far as we can. We know our partners at the NAACP on the ground here um, who also have new leadership are going to be pushing the issue as far as we can. We're not going to keep settling for you know a no response from the district attorney's office. Um, this is an individual who was elected to to seek justice for everyone. And again, the, the fact that they're not even willing to investigate it, their feet need to be held to the fire on these types of issues too. Because when you see 14-year-old kids being assaulted by grown men for simply recording a video or standing there and doing nothing, uh, there is no justice. Um, and until that happens, we're not going to keep um, – you know, continuing to just say, let's let's talk about processes. Too often that's been the request. We're demanding uh, solutions right now where we have specific demands. This officer needs to be terminated. Um, and the longer they're waiting to terminate it, um, we're going to keep seeking um, potentially additional clients to pursue this and open up this further. They have the ability um, to, to handle this matter in-house. But again, they're afraid of their they're afraid of their uh, unions. Um, and I'll call out the police unions for this because they do this time and time again. Um, they continue to cape for bad officers engaged in misconduct, and it denigrates and destroys the rest of the field. And then they come and say, you can't paint us all with a bad picture. But when you're not even willing to stand up to the worst of the worst, what you just saw on, on a video like this, it makes it hard to take them credibly when they're making or taking a position uh, surrounding accountability or surrounding justice and treatment uh, of really anybody. Um, so, again, we're, we're asking for specific demands and specific solutions here. Uh, I don't want to be included in their process. I can tell you what the, the process should be here for excessive force. Stop assaulting our black kids. It's pretty right. simple, uh, but they're not doing it. So fire the officer and okay. prosecute. Uh, we surely... All right. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you. All right, folks, I'll be right back. Roland Martin on the filter on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, a relationship that we have to have. We're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it. That's right. We're talking about our relationship with money. And here's the thing. Our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not. The truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge. Balancing your relationship with your pocketbook. That's next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
As I said, come on. Uh, as I said, folks, uh, we're talking about this issue of uh, housing and micro uh, home ownership. Pretty uh, interesting concept here. Uh, there's a community in Atlanta area called the Booker T. Washington. Um, uh, it's called the Southern South Park Cottages. Uh, Atlanta's first black-owned micro-home community. Uh, joining us right now is the founder and CEO of Techie Homes, Inc., um, uh, uh, of course, uh, Booker T. Washington. So, I, so I'm trying to explain this to me. What is a, what's a micro-home? A, a micro-home, uh, Roland, and first, thanks for, for having me on the show. Um, but a micro-home is just, in its terms, just a smaller home. Um, we've all lived in a home of different sizes. I would say uh, many years ago or decades ago, we lived in much smaller homes that were 800 and 900 square feet, more than we live in homes that are larger sizes now. And so what uh, my organization, Techie Homes, has done is inside of urban metropolitan areas, and Atlanta is just one city of many that's affected by rising rental prices, rising home prices, and rising cost of living that we outpace, especially for minorities who are already trailing behind in home ownership, an opportunity at home ownership. It's almost now that you don't even have a choice at home ownership um, in certain metro areas. It's either to be gentrified out of that area and being forced to rent because there's no home of good quality or new construction that would fit your budgets. And so, um, you know, my organization, Techie Homes, created this community, South Park Cottages, here in College Park, Georgia, outside of Atlanta, for that di distinct purpose of providing some form of accessible and affordable home ownership. So you're talking about homes that, first of all, what are the sizes of these homes? The sizes of our homes range from 400 square feet to 630 square feet. And uh, the reason that we define them as micro homes and not tiny homes is because the average tiny home uh, goes up to 300 square feet and uh, predominantly is on wheels or some form of uh, transported foundation. But these micro homes are all foundation, no different uh, than maybe the home you're, li you're sitting in right now and built in the same construction type um, from standard construction build. Uh, the difference is, is because of the cost of construction to the developer and to the price of the homeowner, which ranges from 180000 to 220000 uh, and an average mortgage being fourteen or $1,500, that is a much better option than renting at the average rent of Atlanta, which now exceeds $2,200 for a one-bedroom apartment. Um, interesting here. Mustafa, uh, you're a big time environmentalist. What do you make of this? Uh, first of all, Booker T. Washington, man, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, um, the materials that you all use? Because, you know, that plays a role also if a home is smaller in the resale value, uh, because we know we're always trying to address the black wealth, white gap that exists in our country. Um, so could you talk right. a little bit about the tech and, and, and what's in the space. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm actually sitting in one of our micro homes right now. Uh, the home I'm sitting in is, uh, is 630 square feet. Um, they're built in modern design and they're built in, the, and I would say, an above builder uh, type of grade build in most homes. Our homes are outside cladded with cement board siding. Um, they're built in a stick built frame. Um, they have 10 foot ceilings. They have farmhouse sinks and granite countertops. They feature one loft and one bedroom uh, loft homes um, and feature, you know, uh, ceramic tile and all of the modern fixtures and recessed lights that you have in any standard or luxury built home. The big difference is, is that we reduce the square footage and expand the living space and experience space for the homeowner, allowing them the opportunity to own a piece of real estate at the same price or lower than they would renting. And we can do it in a small area in these infield lots and abandoned and vacant houses. We can tear them down and put 20 homes in a two acre area, which is better than putting up an apartment where the minorities are being forced to live and not have home ownership, decreasing their opportunity to grow in wealth and grow in prosperity. Uh, Candace.
Yes, sir. Okay, so I did some research on your uh, your bit, your organization, and one thing that I liked about it is that um, it's all black, and it's, mm -hmm. it's it's all everybody working together in partnership. Because you know they always try to say that black people can't work together, and clearly Absolutely. this is what's so the vibe that I'm getting here is the black Wall Street vibe for some reason, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. by me living in Texas. And our cost of living is totally different compared to up north because I currently right. live in a 6,400 square foot home and I'm only paying $1,200. So how would that work coming into Texas? Because I'm going to tell you not, nobody in Texas is not going to pay that amount. So how would you maneuver that? But our product, uh, and thank you for that, and, and, and by being uh, all black developed, um, this community and this development, which is a multi-million dollar develop, development, we develop by crowdfunding. We develop by going to social media and talking and asking people that look like us and that connect with us that we wanted to build this type of community. Now, there are more rural spaces and there are urban and metropolitan spaces. This type of community much more fits in a metropolitan and urban space because in a rural space, there will be larger homes at a much lower price. So, for example, the average 1,200 square foot to 2,000 square foot home in Atlanta inside of the major metro Atlanta area, new construction, will cost you close to half a million. Now, to afford that house, you have to be making or household has to be making close to $125,000 to live. Now, for minorities who predominantly work in urban areas and more labor jobs or jobs that incomes are under $60,000. If you're not building a home that fits their cost of living, how would they ever be able to afford a home unless they move outside of the area they work in? And if they move outside the area they work in, then you predominantly are putting more stresses on that household and more stresses on their income which makes the equity gap and the wealth gap go farther and farther apart. The only ethnic group to decline in net worth over the pandemic were black folk. And the main reason why is because incomes went up, gentrification went up, rents went up, investor home buying of single family and density housing went up. And they moved out black people more and more out of urban areas. You can say that about Chicago, Atlanta, L.A., Miami, and in the course of New York, of course. But that's just where we are. I got I got literally 45 seconds. Demario, quick question, quick answer. Go. Man, Booker T. Washington, I love the name. Went to Booker T. Washington High School. I uh, appreciate yep. the work that you're doing. It's really amazing to hear. Yes. Tell me a little Tell us more about the... Crowdfunding, how that works? How does that work? So the, the way we crowdfunded is, is in this institution of, of development and real estate, there's always heavy capital uh, needs. And so um, we wanted to prove a point that our community, which has over a trillion dollars of disposable income as black folks, where we spend more of our consumer dollars on material things and other ethnic groups, we wanted to showcase that our ethnic group and others can combine and from their own pockets and small amounts of money do big things. And that's how we created the first ever micro built community that uh, is a $6 million community that sold out in under 30 days. All right, then. Uh, Booker T. Washington, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. Uh, good luck with it. Yes, sir. Thanks, Ro. Demario, Candace, uh, Mustafa, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much for y'all joining us on the panel today, folks. That is it for me. Uh, don't forget, download our app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And, of course, support us by joining our Brina Funk fan club. Check your money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037. You can also contribute via PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, or Zelle. Folks, I will see you tomorrow right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Holla! Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches! I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Support this